Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues. Um, welcome to the CTUI hybrid uh, event, Employment Forecasts uh, and scenarios in the EU, what implications for macroeconomic policies. Um, my name is Sotiria Theodoropoulou, and I am the head of research unit European Economic, Employment and Social Policies, and I will be moderating this event today. Uh, before I move on to introductions, I would like to kindly ask uh, online participants to use the Q&A uh, function um, for any questions or remarks uh, they may have. Um, so today's event marks uh, the publication by the EPUI for the second year in a row of employment forecasts for different sectors and labor force groups across the EU under different scenarios involving not just uh, macroeconomic um, scenarios, but also other broader developments affecting the economy and work. For example, the, uh, the pandemic, the evolution of pandemic. For a second year in a row, we commissioned the Vienna Institute of International Economic uh, Studies to produce these uh, forecasts. Um, our motivation has been to provide the European labor movement, uh, but also anyone who is interested in uh, policies with an impact on employment with insights, with scientifically produced projections uh, of employment dynamics, so as to inform their policy positions and demands to national and EU policymakers. We thought that this exercise uh, was of particular importance last year um, when governments around Europe, around Europe were considering um, their options regarding job retention schemes. Should they roll them back? Should they carry on with them? And we consider it very important again this year uh, when following a dramatic change of circumstances in uh, Europe, um, we see uh, an inflation surge and a cost of living crisis, um, macroeconomic policies, monetary and fiscal are once again at crossroads, possibly under those purposes. So we have seen in the last few months central banks around the world um, raising their interest rates in an attempt to rein inflation. Um, whereas the long-awaited EU economic governance reform with its fiscal rules is supposed to move forward with an expected communication by the European Commission uh, coming up soon as far as I understand. Um, all this is happening while EU governments have seen their public debt uh, soaring once again, following the measures they had to undertake during the pandemic to mitigate the impact of the pandemic. Um, while they currently also have to follow up with measures uh, uh, attempting to mitigate the impact of inflation on households and firms. So what we want to discuss here today is whether given the scenarios presented in the report, macroeconomic policies are moving um, in the right direction, or if not, what this direction should be. Uh, so we have a panel of distinguished speakers here with, that, with us today, and I'm very happy for that. So we will first have uh, Robert Sterr, who's the scientific director of the Vienna Institute of Economic, International Economic Studies and the author of the report, present us the findings. And then we will be joined by Martin Sandbu, the Financial Times European Economics commentator, um, uh, virtually. We also have uh, Joao Nogueira Martins, who's head of unit of the policy coordination unit at DG ECFIN. And Lee Nakar, uh, who's the Federal Secretary of the ETUC, responsible for the economic governance portfolio, to give us their comments on what implications these forecasts uh, have for macroeconomic policies in Europe. So without further ado, I will pass the floor on to Robert to present the report. Robert? Okay, thanks for this very good introduction and the kind of I have to the screen as so, uh, Okay, um, so what I will do is uh, to present the main results of this uh, study. Um, so look carefully at the title. Uh, I squeezed in the word scenarios instead of forecasts, because in these uh, times of very uh, unfortunate and, uh, and really uncertain developments, I think one wants to talk about scenarios than really forecast what must happen with respect to employment, and this was the focus of this of this uh, study. Um, well, I I could. 
preview over four uh, broad issues. First, I will show you a bit of the long run trends. I will sketch how the scenarios are calculated. Uh, These scenario, scenario calculations are, uh, how to say, it's, a, it's not too sophisticated. There are much more sophisticated models around, but I still think they give a very good uh, impression of potential uh, scenarios in the future. I present some selected results and then come to some <laughs> then we'll followed up by colleagues in the in the um, looking at the long term employment levels, uh, one can see basically that we haven't recovered much uh, since uh, the crisis in 2008 2009 so from the global financial crisis. But this is an, indica uh, this is an indica index of 2019 equals one. And you see it particularly that for hours worked. So the upper line is like the blue line. Uh, the index in 2019 or 2020 before the pandemics has been at the level of 2008 or 9, like it is uh, before the financial crisis. So since then, basically, the number of hours worked in the U27 hasn't uh, increased. You see a bit more increase, of course, uh, in terms of persons employed with temporary workers, part-time employees, and so on and so forth. So here you see a bit of more increase in terms of employment. And of course, you see a much strong increase in terms of value added, the dark line. Uh, the difference, of course, between measures of employment and value added is labor productivity growth, which drives uh, this, this difference. Well, then you see basically in the pandemic, uh, in 2020, 2021, you see a sharp drop in terms of value added and persons employed, uh, sorry, and, and hours worked, but less so in terms of persons employed, which basically was uh, driven by these contagion measures on short-term work arrangements, etc., by the governments to limit the impact of the, of the corona crisis. And uh, basically, then we looked at what will happen given some of the outcomes uh, after 2021, uh, based on long run trends in the way. <clears throat> so uh, I sketch a bit what we do uh, technology wise, uh, just to give you a glimpse uh, how we, we tackle these, these scenario calculations. So basically, we start from overall macroeconomic growth forecasts uh, provided by the Commission and the IMF. Uh, IMF from spring, and uh, basically we used the summer update of the European Commission. Uh, given the delays of the studies, to, we are, of course, we are always a bit <laughs> behind the act, most actual forecast, but I will tell you a bit how we squeezed in our assumptions as well here. Um, we already discounted the growth rates we got from IMF and the Commission in, in spring and summer. Uh, given at least the uh, more bleak outlooks anticipated in writing the study, so this was in April, May. Um, however, when the actual commission forecast came out, these are still relatively optimistic, as we know. Um, so for 2022, it's still at 4.3%, for 2023, 2.5%. We used even a bit lower numbers than in the, in the study, uh, because uh, maybe in April, May, it looked even more uh, bleak and uh, it, it looks now, but so the future is quite, quite well, quite unknown. Uh, what we do then is basically we use this macro growth rates. We break them down uh, by industrial value added shares and long-term growth rates. So we really get these uh, growth rates at the sectoral level compatible with the macro growth rates and the long run trends basically. And when one subtracts the trends in labor productivity growth rates at the sectoral level, it's a bit of squeezing in and out. Uh, we basically get <clears throat> employment growth rates. So basically, we get the difference between value added growth rates and employment growth rates at the sectoral level. And then, basically, uh, having employment growth rate at the sectoral level, we can break them down uh, also by employment labor force groups like age, uh, educational groups, uh, occupational groups, and so on. So, this was just a, the simple framework. Uh, which we do the, the calculation for all the U27 countries uh, and for 10 or 11 NACE revision to uh, one digit uh, industry. Um, what is the main outcomes? So 
in the baseline scenario, which basically is this uh, commission and IMF growth forecast, so we subtracted uh, one or one half percentage point growth rates. In this baseline scenario, uh, we would get an increase of persons employed until 2027, starting in 2021, by about 5%. In terms of hours worked, we would get an increase of about 3%. Of course, we have a dip, a dip more now, and it goes a bit straighter on last time, but this is the, the basic result here. If we go to an even more adverse scenario, so even subtracting even more macroeconomic growth, we basically would stay at more or less zero growth of hours worked, similar to what we have then in from the global financial crisis on, uh, and very little growth in terms of persons employed. If we go to the more optimistic scenario, this optimistic scenario is, by the way, now the forecast of the Commission in spring, summer, and the IMF in, in summer, uh, then we could, could get even higher growth rates of 8% plus employees, 6%. So given the more optimistic growth rates than in the in the newest uh, in the latest forecast by the Commission, um, and the, uh, and our patient scenarios so, are uh, the likely the most likely outcome would be in between maybe the baseline and the optimistic scenario we, we have here, given mm -hmm. that this forecast hold uh, from uh, oh, country wise, of course, we get quite different results. Uh, we get much more optimistic results in terms of employment growth for Greece and, and Luxembourg. Uh, however, given the data, that these are driven by very low, and in the case of uh, Greece, even negative productivity growth rates, right? so we have not adjusted for that. But uh, subtracting or having less, a little more productivity growth, it's of course the employment growth would be a bit less for them. But for this, we have a rather, rather a positive outlook. On the other hand, we have very negative outlook for Portugal, Hungary, and Cyprus. Uh, or sorry, it's also good fun for them because they forecast the forecasts a high macro growth rate. Right? Um, on the other hand, for Romania and Ireland and the Baltic, uh, we have. Uh, less optimistic outcomes and even negative employment growth rates because these countries report over the long period uh, much stronger labor productivity growth, basically for which the value-added growth forecasted for these countries is not enough to, to, to make uh, a positive employment growth possible. So in general, for EU27 as a whole, as I said, these growth forecasts are at least in the baseline, the optimistic scenario, slightly positive. Uh, and I think it's also in line with uh, what we see from uh, the unemployment rates which are documented in the uh, EU forecast, which are expected to decline from 7.1% in 2021 to 6.5% um, in 2023, though with a very large variation across countries, of course. Right? So this, I'm not documenting this here, but of course, uh, the very wide set of country experiences um, in, that, in that respect. Um, one question was also then how this compares, but because this compares the level of employment from 2021 to 2027, one question also was, uh, what does this mean when I, or when we compare the employment levels, the scenarios of the employment levels uh, compared to the pre-pandemic year 2019? Uh, and then basically the outcome is, well, employment in persons employed has already uh, recovered more or less, whereas employment in terms of hours worked will uh, take until about 2026, until we get the level of uh, 2029. 20, 20, okay, so this is, uh, if we compare to the pre-corona <laughs> phases, uh, we will get this, uh, this result. Um, when it comes to the sectoral breakdown, uh, maybe not too surprising, we get very strong growth rates, mostly in <clears throat> intensive business services, so information communication technologies, professional scientific, technical administration, support and service activities, <clears throat> and very strong negative growth rates, particularly in agriculture, with up to minus five or up to minus 10% over this longer period, so accumulated over this period, uh, and also financial and insurance activities because of high productivity growth rates in these. <clears throat> Um, and finally, uh, what is the breakdown with respect uh, to labor force groups? Um, here, a caveat, uh, we only see, look at the sectoral 
uh, the composition of these and not have the trends within sectors on age groups or on, on gender groups. Uh, implementing this would be a step forward uh, and would basically, in most cases, we will have some results on that would reinforce the patterns you see here, but basically we look here only at the structural shifts uh, because or industry shifts uh, which are considered here. What we do find is, uh, well, we get the slightly more positive growth rates for female employment um, compared to male employment. We get uh, slightly higher growth rates for the younger uh, aged people, 25 to 29, 15 to 24. Um, so this differs very heavily across countries, and each country has its own or similar, its own pattern. So this is only the U27 aggregate, but at the country level, we get very diverse uh, patterns here. And with respect to the occupations, uh, basically we find relatively similar growth rates uh, by occupations. Um, however, the only exception is uh, we get very strong negative growth rates for skilled agricultural, forestry, and fishery work. But which of course is in line with the strong decline of employment in the agriculture uh, industry. Okay. So these are the main results without going more into detail. Uh, what are the risk challenges and opportunities ahead? Um, of course, well, with this uh, awful Russian war of aggression against the Ukraine, uh, with all these debates on the energy shortages and the uh, resulting inflation surge, uh, and of course, the ECB response to the inflation surge. And well, I think there's a delicate balance now. The ECB has to has to, to combat uh, between combating these high inflation rates uh, without reducing the economic dynamics because the high uncertainty might reduce anyway, but also keeping up real income levels and demand in a way. So it, it's really a kind of delicate balance. Uh, to have this stagflationary period we are facing in and how to, to meet the, the challenges of that. Of course, the outcome also depends very much on this uh, reform reformulation of the EU fiscal rules, which are still pending, but might have to be a bit more touching on that from the panelists. Um, we also thought about uh, introducing these long-term effects of what is called this dual transition. So on the effect of digitalization, which might impact that labor productivity growth is even higher. Uh, so employment growth would be even less uh, strong. However, uh, given some econometrics and some of the literature, so far the literature finds very little evidence for strong effects of digitalization on employment. And we have not yet, well, basically we, we don't touch on productivity growth rate. On the other hand, we are facing these environmental changes. Um, qualitatively, I think about this might be only a kind of personal <laughs> view uh, that could have some positive effects, basically with a lot of investments and restructuring needs, uh, the economy needs to, to make this carbon transition possible. So this might impact positively on, on growth rates in general and in growth rates of, uh, of and finally, we, we face this labor supply changes. Um, first of all, first, maybe the attitude towards work, so this remote work, it does not change the level of, of preservement upon uh, person employed. But maybe also the work perception, so having less work and more work-life balance and so on, which is difficult, of course, to predict which outcomes is on the actual labor supply. And finally, which I always mention, I think is a very important aspect to we looked at when it comes to the longer run that we face very strong demographic developments, uh, which I think, at least in some countries, are already partly kicking in uh, in terms of labor shortages, not only for high skilled workers and for particular skill, skills of the workforce, but in general. Uh, and we see more and more, I think, these demographic developments will kick in. And this is one of the big things one has also to look at uh, in the near future. Okay, so this was just a quick overview of the study and uh, adding, handing on to the uh, panelists. Thank you very much for this, uh, uh, for presenting us your methodology and uh, uh, the main uh, effects. And I think one uh, important insight is that uh, the most likely thing we, under the current scenarios is that um, uh, employment will grow as a headcount, but it will take some time until working hours 
at least uh, with uh, reference to the pre-pandemic situation, because the pandemic is still uh, some, a phenomenon that is ongoing and we don't know what kind of turn it might also take in the future. So working hours may take some time to, uh, uh, will take some time to recover. And um, I also um, kept one insight that you say, if this forecast is likely to hold, which is I think exactly the crux of what we want to discuss here today, um, whether uh, given the options that uh, macroeconomic policymakers uh, and uh, yeah have uh, today, uh, whether the, the, their choices are li likely to make this forecast more or less likely to hold. So with this, I'll uh, pass on the floor to Martin Sandbu, who is joining us online today. Thank you very much uh, for being here. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? You, you can hear me. I didn't hear the answer. <laughs> Very good. Um, th thanks so much for having me. And I'm sorry I can't join you uh, in person, but uh, but that's that's how it is. And I do have to apologize in advance that I may have to leave a little bit early uh, due to other commitments. Um, but but thanks so much for uh, for giving me the opportunity to to just share my impressions of of this report. And I look forward to hearing as much of the rest of the discussion as I can as I can stay for. Um, I'm told we have about 10 minutes each, so I'll try to keep it within that. Um, but I, I wanted to go through briefly, let's say, five kind of headings in terms of reactions. Uh, and let me just preface all that by just saying how good it is to have this sort of research presented. Uh, I don't think we have focused enough on the labor market in all the debates we've had uh, over the last couple of years, uh, including what the right cyclical policy stance should be now. Um, so more, more please, you know, this is very welcome and we need more of it. Um, so the, the, the first point uh, I just want to highlight is not even about the forecasts that are made, but just by how the report sets out the data to date as well, uh, because what it shows, these, these tables and charts, once you look at the report, everyone should read the report, uh, is just how surprisingly strong employment performance in the EU has been, um, both in the recovery from the pandemic and even before that. So the report has this nice you know, benchmark to 2019 or 2021, what the employment levels and our levels are. Uh, and the fact is that we're pretty much at record highs in terms of employment, uh, certainly in the Eurozone and, and in the EU as a whole. Uh, and I think that the speed of hiring and jobs creation that we have seen in the recovery from the pandemic. Uh, the report goes up to 21 because it has annual data, but if you look at quarterly data in 2022, this continued into 2022. Uh, we've been seeing that continental European economies can actually be much more dynamic uh, in terms of the labor market than the, the standard cliche that we saw in, uh, you know, in the Financial Times and, and other, other Anglo-American economic press, for example, uh, in terms of the standard impression of what the Eurozone economies can do. So I just want to point that out as one of the things the report uh, brings to light, uh, that jobs can be created fast and dynamically in the EU. Um, the second point I want to raise uh, is taken the forecast for what they are, I like these three different scenarios, it's very interesting to see the, the, the spread in the possible outcomes. Um, I'd like us to reflect a bit about what a good outcome would be. What are the sort of forecasts that we would say, well, that would be good. Um, do we want to have many more jobs? Well, I suppose we do, we want to have jobs, um, but we do want to think a little bit about the reason why people you know, if, if employment really goes up by five points and we're already at record highs, why is it that more people will be working? It had better be for the right reasons, that they have good jobs on offer rather than how they need to get more jobs uh, in order to survive, right? Uh, we can say the same thing about ours. Um, what would be the, the kind of welcome forecast in terms of hours versus number of jobs? My, my takeaway from the report is that hours are growing, have been growing more slowly than jobs, and this could continue for some time. Well, what that means is that employers aren't uh, getting their workers to work as many hours as they used to. 
given that that gap has, has increased since 2019. And I think we want to reflect on why that is. Uh, does that mean that there's some capacity slack in the labor market we're not measuring? Uh, people could be working more hours on their existing jobs. What does it say about our macroeconomic environment that hours growth is lagging behind? Alternatively, maybe the interpretation is that people are getting better wages so they don't have to work quite as hard. But these are the questions we, this kind of, these kinds of numbers should make us ask. Uh, third, I'd like to focus a little bit on what this study cannot say. And that is not a criticism because I think the study is very good, but I think it's also important to be aware of what, because of the necessary methodology, we cannot conclude here. Uh, so some of the things that the study uh, kind of by construction cannot pick up uh, are the potential for, for big structural change that's different from what we've seen before. Uh, so if I've understood the methodology right, you are using historical trends within sectors and between sectors, which means that if the pandemic caused, let's call it a, uh, a step change in the rhythm of structural change and the nature of structural change, a sudden new reallocation between sectors, for example, that's not something this methodology could pick up. Um, now, I'm not sure how you would measure that, but I think it's worth keeping in mind that if the pandemic fundamentally changed the economy and will now, you know, the economy is kind of trying to reallocate labor between tasks and jobs within sectors or between sectors in a way that wasn't happening before, then we're missing that in these forecasts. Um, and another issue that, uh, that this methodology cannot pick up is to what extent productivity and therefore your derivation of jobs prospects uh, from growth prospects, how that itself may or may not vary with the strength of the labor market. So there is a view that I think is a sensible view, uh, but it's a contested view, that when labor markets are very strong from the workers' point of view, very tight from employers' point of view, that is when you get productivity growth because employers have to do better with the labor they have. In which case, again, these more historical trends in terms of productivity change could be upset. Uh, so that's another thing to, to have in mind as we broaden the discussion. Uh, finally, one thing I think is very important is that cyclicality, you know, when labor, when employment prospects worsen or, or improve, um, that affects different sectors of the, of the labor market very differently. And, and there was some of that in the report, uh, but it's based again, I think, on historical trends Whereas in the cyclical aspect of this, uh, what we know is that when the cycle turns, when jobs stop growing, jobs stop being created, it's really the people on the margins of the labor market who uh, are fired first or who are not hired and would otherwise be hired. Um, so I would quite have liked to see some more data and more thinking about uh, the breakdown of this in terms of labor market groups by income, for example, and by education level, from what I could tell, there was something by, uh, by professional category, but not by education level directly measured. So all of those things make me think that this is a conservative study in the sense that the effects of whether the economy does well or badly could be even bigger than what the study sets out. So conservative in that sense. Um, finally, very quickly. Um, I think it's worth to, to kind of do a little reality check on ourselves. So take the good scenario. Um, if I saw the numbers right, jobs uh, in employment will increase by eight points, eight percentage points, uh, or 8% from, from the 2019 peak. Um, given that we're already at record high levels, it's very hard to imagine employment in continental Europe getting eight points higher than it already was. I mean, maybe it's possible, but it would be unheard of, especially in such short times. Uh, the mythology, of course, is to project historical trends onto what we forecast about growth um, and derive numbers from there. But, but we could also use this number kind of to think backwards. It's unlikely that we'd increase employment by that much. What would happen instead? Well, hours would presumably increase. Maybe productivity would have to be increased, or maybe the growth forecast won't pan out. Um, but I think it's important. Uh, I, I think it's important to, to think about, you know, can we really imagine these numbers that follow from the maths 
can we really imagine them work out in practice and what would it mean? On the other hand, as I pointed out, we have just seen extraordinary an extraordinary experience in the labor market. So maybe it is possible to do much better than we think. Mm. Uh, finally, then, what does all this mean for policy? Uh, it kind of goes back to my original question. Do we see strong job growth as something good or something bad? Um, well, on the whole, I've been trying to say we should see it as something as something good, although we do notice we do want to think about why job numbers are increasing and why hours maybe are not increasing as much as they could. Um, but it's it's a fact that at the moment in macroeconomic policy making and especially in central banks, strong jobs growth is seen as something to worry about, uh, something that probably needs to be slowed down. So I think there's a bit of a paradox here. We are struggling, I think, to deal with macroeconomic policy in an era of strong negative supply shocks, where we have high inflation, largely, especially in the EU, driven by energy prices. Um, the current stance is that you need to you need to rein in demand, you know, put a break on demand, maybe even cause a recession or at least a, a slowdown in order to stop that. I'm not at all sure that that's right. Uh, but in any case, it's a debate that we need to have because given the energy shock that we've had, it's now because become the mainstream policy view that jobs growth would be in a sense a bad thing. Um, that is something that needs to be democratically anchored uh, if people are going to tolerate it, if we now start to witness central banks slowing down the economy and maybe even causing a recession. Uh, on the fiscal side, it was mentioned now several times that we are, of course, due a reform of the fiscal governance system. I think the main thing to keep in mind here, which also ties into some of the points uh, I've made, is whether the new fiscal framework will be more investment friendly. Uh, on a kind of simple view, more investment, if it causes more productivity, is bad for jobs, right? Because you need fewer jobs to create the same output. Historically, I think we tend to see that when investment is strong is also when labor growth is strong. Um, so I think we need to, to, to embrace labor productivity and see it as something that can both help job growth, but in particular, perhaps help with the quality of jobs. Um, those were the sort of remarks I wanted to make. Uh, again, I welcome the report very much. Uh, I find the results convincing within the limitations that I've set out. Uh, but above all, I think uh, something that's the start of a conversation rather than the end of one. So thanks very much for the report and thanks for having me and I look forward to the rest of the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin Stambul, for this insightful uh, for the feedback on the report. It's uh, also very useful for us uh, for continuing this exercise. So I will now pass on the floor to Joao. And... Thank you. Good morning. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I start being, I believe, a relatively familiar face to at um, meetings. Um, advance warning. Uh, many of the things that I had planned to tell you were told by Martin probably in a more eloquent manner, and we have not uh, been talking to each other, I believe, now for several years. So uh, um, I can guarantee we didn't, uh, didn't uh, plan this in advance. Uh, I understand that you want me to talk now on, two, uh, on three topics. Uh, the first one, observations on the current economic outlook. The second one of what we ex can expect from the economic governance review, on which the Commission will put some papers uh, very soon. And finally, on the uh, report that uh, is the pretext of us uh, being, uh, being here. <laughs> on the economic outlook, we are now in the Commission in the middle of our autumn campaign, of uh, preparation of our autumn forecasts. Uh, the cutoff day will be uh, in a week uh, from today, and the publication is scheduled on the 11th of November. As usual, I cannot and I will not tell you what are exactly our new numbers, what is in our forecast, but I can make a number of observations uh, based on the data which have been published in the meantime. If we look into the real economy, hard data, we have seen lots of positive developments, perhaps surprisingly. This relates in particular to better than expected GDP outturn in the uh, second quarter of this year. Already after 
the, 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 um, the invasion of Ukraine. Let's see what Eurostat will tell us about the third quarter. I think they published their numbers also in a, in a, in a week. Um, because of the strength of economic activity in the second quarter, a number of forecasters have even revised their numbers upwards, which again is quite surprising in a sense, if we had just read the news about uh, supply chain problems, inflation uh, or aggression and aggression. In the summer we had in, in, in ECFIN, for the year, for the euro area, for the EU is basically the same, a number of 2.7. The figures that uh, the IMF published uh, you know, 12 days ago, were at 3.1. So I think these are positive developments. Second, and Martin referred to that, there has been a continued strength in the, in the labor market. Two years ago, when we were in the first autumn under COVID, and we had not yet started the vaccination campaigns, I'm not sure many of us would have predicted a strong rebound that we have observed in the Western economies and on the very good results in the labor market. In spring 2022, as Robert mentioned, and then uh, Martin as well, the number of jobs in most European economies was at all time highs or very close to that. But on the other hand, we see currently an intensification of an energy crisis, specifically on gas, but beyond that, which has resulted in a substantial deterioration of the economic sentiment indicators, which we publish in ECFIN every, every month. This risks being a protracted issue. What our experts tell us is that the gas that Europe has in storage will be enough for this winter. We will not expect blackouts across the EU. I'm not sure that's okay for the United Kingdom, Martin. Uh, um, we do not expect blackouts across uh, the EU this winter or any form of energy rationing other than through the price system. Somehow the uncertainty is even for the subsequent winter. Anyhow, all the indications point now to a clear worsening of the economic outlook for the rest of the year and possibly beyond. Many forecasters, as you may have seen, actually indicate negative growth rates for the last quarter of this year and the beginning of the next year. The question is actually when and how strong will the rebound be and or what are the risks of a longer recession? And of course, inflation, much higher than many of us can remember. I think you have to come from a peripheral European country like me, or be of some age, like me, to have a vivid memory of double-digit inflation. I suspect many of us do not have such a memory. I do. And of course, this has a quite considerable impact in the purchasing power of the wage earners. Policymakers effectively are at this moment facing a very complex situation. This applies to central banks. I will not say much about central banks, otherwise it will be... Um, a problem with ECB independence, and Martin has written this just over the last days, but this also applies to the fiscal authorities. On fiscal, I suspect we are now in one of these situations in which there is a disconnection between what we say and what we do. First, given inflation, I think there is a consensus only some dissonant voices. There is a consensus that the fiscal stance for 2022 and then in 2023 should not be expansionary and be perhaps just neutral. Let's see what we'll publish in our figures on the 11th of November. I suspect we see an expansionary stance in 2022 and perhaps also in 2023. A disconnection between what we suggest and what we observe. Second, Concerning the measures that the member states are adopting specifically to tackle the energy crisis or the impact on the households of the increase in the energy on the energy prices, we have, the Commission has very often sp uh, spoken in favor of three criteria to assess this. Fiscal affordability. The measures could not be extremely expensive. We should avoid measures that promote consumption and social effectiveness. We should focus on the most vulnerable. 
Is this what we have observed? I'm not so sure. And advanced warning, don't ask me what you think of the uh, German uh, plan. It contains good things, contains a few bad things, and is very big. 200 billion, just to have an order of magnitude, is two thirds of the RRF grants for six years across all Europe. On the reform of the Sabrina Dose Pact, that is my second point that you brought me here. What can I say at this stage? First, the Commission will make its proposals known on the 9th of November. The date is now in the public domain, and I'm sure that several of you are registering it in your calendars. We hope to have a consensus in a matter of months on the basis of what the Commission put on the table, and then we'll see if change in the legislation is necessary. Again, I cannot say what the communication will announce, but I can tell you what have been the key words of the long period of dialogue that we have. What are these key words? First, simplification. Our system used to be still extremely concept complex, based often on arcane indicators. We have to make a big effort there. Second, we need to better connect fiscal plans with the structural reforms because that sustainability can be achieved through deficit discipline but also depends on economic growth we need to make the two things better connect third an attention to the medium term the problem or the origin of the motivation of the stability of pact is that sustainability and should continue being like that but if it's about that sustainability then it does not perhaps make much sense to look into small deviations year by year. But at the same time, we cannot have the member states every year preparing a new stability program that continuously delays the day of reckoning and the necessary adjustment. More national ownership. If we have learned something with the preparation of the recovery and resilience plans, is that rather than telling member states what to do, it's better to define a number of common principles and then let them organize their own plans. Enforcement, a slightly less pleasant word. A system like the one that we had now, based on abstract concepts, abstract indicators, non-observables, and requiring sometimes massive fiscal adjustments was not credible and therefore not enforceable. What we need, and what I hope to see, is a system that is more credible and therefore more enforceable. What we should expect is a trade-off or a better connection between more credibility and more gradualism in the deficit or debt reductions. Therefore, I do not see the risk that Robert identified in his paper that if now the, the new rules required a massive correction in the deficit. Very quickly on the paper, which, as I said, ultimately is the pretext that brought us here. I need to tell you a little story, Robert, first, mm -hmm. I, before I start. And uh, none of you knew this story before. Um, after my graduation and my postgrad studies, long ago in the last decade of the past century, <laughs> one of my jobs was precisely to project developments in the Portuguese labor, labor market, somehow very similar to what we have here now. It was in particular on the demand for uh, university graduates. The entity that commissioned me this task was uh, some Portuguese university. I'm not sure that they ever paid me because shortly after that, I moved to Brussels and then I, 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 I spent the rest of my life floating between the ECB and the commission and the council in the European institutions. End little story. I like the paper. Including because it brought me these fond memories of you. <laughs> the assumptions and the methodology are very transparent. Nothing to criticize there. Actually, the work I think is a heroic effort, even the magnitude of the task. But there are a few a few aspects that I would have liked to see better developed or developed differently in the paper. First, I don't see in the paper really a relationship between wages and jobs. I believe that the loss in purchasing power that we are observing now is not 
I clarify, is not favorable for the labor market. But can we really discuss the evolution of jobs over six or seven years and not discussing wages? Second, the point that was mentioned by Martin before, The paper would gain, if it discussed in a clearer manner, the impact of these several shocks in the economic structure of the economies. The COVID crisis and the energy crisis may have, I should not say may have, the COVID and the energy crisis have certainly accelerated the divergences in the long-term productivity across the sectors. So projections based on the COVID trends may not be the ideal. This is probably the aspect in which I was less satisfied with the paper. Also, the current crisis is not affecting all countries the same way. Could we expect a resumption of the migration flows that we have observed within the EU and the Euro area just a decade ago? I think this is a topic that is, will be worth discussing. We face big asymmetric shocks or symmetric shocks with big asymmetric impacts. What can we expect from the energy crisis and the decoupling between the EU and the Russian economy? Should we expect a new migration flow out of the Baltics or from Bulgaria? Two more points. In a paper like this, we look into the figures in the number of in the look into the number of jobs. Of course, that's what the, the, the paper is about. But I would have also liked to see the tables and the charts with the figures of the employment rates and on the unemployment rates. And surprisingly, they are not there. I think that once we do this exercise, it will reveal that the growth rate of employment is not that meager. To my mind, the projections for countries like Greece or Portugal are actually very optimistic. And the projections for countries like Ireland are almost miserabilistic. All the more, and we are now definitely in the moment of demographic transition. Over the six years before 2022, the population of working age in Europe is declining. So we are now in a situation of declining uh, uh, employment potential, and therefore you should not expect very strong growth rates. To conclude, allow me to return to my initial point when I commented that we have surprisingly good results in terms of GDP economic activity this year, and surprisingly good results in terms of labor market. Why? This is a question of major relevance for the public authorities like the commission and i think also for the social parties and for the trade unions clearly the fiscal the monetary uh, policies and the labor market policies in 2020 were very close to the ideal in a very difficult situation the dissemination of short time working schemes helped the dissemination of short-time working schemes in most, if not all, European Union economies was extremely positive. Probably one of the most relevant structural reforms of the last decade. But all the structural reforms in the labor market and in the product market, again, over the last decade, have also helped. I would therefore like to challenge Robert and Sotirian, the European Trade Union Institute and the Vienna Institute to address this question. To which extent the labor market reforms and the product market reforms adopted in so many countries in Europe over the last decade are effectively behind the very good results of the first half of 2022 in very surprising and difficult circumstances? I stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for your uh, extensive uh, 
feedback on policies and the report and for the uh, challenging and provocative uh, question to consider for the debate, but also for uh, these focus. And I would like to pass the floor to uh, the uh, from the EPUC to give her insights on the report and what we're going to do in Europe. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for uh, inviting uh, us, uh, ETUC, to, uh, to give our uh, thoughts and uh, comments on, on this uh, report. Indeed, it's it's a second one now. Uh, we had the first one against the uh, COVID. Um, and I suppose from the ETUC point of view, we are... Uh, the, the recipients of this report. For us, it, uh, it's a report or one of uh, uh, the reports that uh, uh, we uh, uh, could, sh should, uh, will use when we are uh, thinking about uh, um, our response uh, to what is happening uh, uh, in Europe, and especially with the view of uh, um, our Congress, which is next year in May, uh, where we are uh, intensively thinking uh, about the next four years, uh, starting from May 24. Um, so what, what is the kind of question when I, when I was reading this report, the, the question for me is kind of how can I use it? When I'm, when I'm drafting, when my team is drafting, uh, uh, the the documents uh, uh, the view forward for the the next uh, four years four and a half years um, and uh, I must say there are there are there are some helpful data there but on the other hand it's uh, uh, I think provoked more questions than uh, I got answers. Uh, I was reading, I was looking at the, the, the different sectors um, and uh, the negative uh, projection for construction sector, for example. Uh, if I put next to it what I know from our uh, building and uh, woodworkers federation, for example, the incredible need for the workforce uh, to uh, really carry out uh, all the initiatives that uh, are derived from the Green Deal in Europe, where we need to uh, uh, renovate uh, buildings, uh, where uh, we hear hopefully the war in Ukraine will end soon uh, and would require enormous uh, workforce to reconstruct the country. Uh, where European uh, companies, I'm sure, uh, would like to play an active uh, role. Uh, and uh, uh, it's not enough. The, the workers in Ukraine, uh, European workers, would also be uh, involved. So, and that's, that's the construction sector. Maybe I'm misunderstanding something, but for, for me, there is a question mark. Uh, the other question mark, I come from Estonia, so another periphery the ex other extreme <laughs> um, and I remember the, the double digit uh, inflation um, very well um, but um, the, the negative uh, uh, again uh, in terms of uh, employment growth for Estonia for example what I read constantly uh, sort of almost every day in the, in the papers is that, that uh, there is a shortage of uh, employment, uh, there is shortage of uh, people. So uh, if there is a, such a dire need for, for workers, how does it fit in with the uh, uh, decline in employment? Um, so there, there are these kind of uh, questions. Uh, then the, the, if I look at what is happening at uh, European level in terms of uh, policies and changes, um, uh, daily economic governance review we've been all waiting for uh, for a long time because we actually started before COVID. Uh, the first uh, 
communication came out just before COVID and we gave our input. And then when it came back on the table, we gave input again. And uh, well, fingers crossed, hopefully it will come now. <laughs> And, and we will see, and uh, um, we will obviously give our view on, on what we see in the, in the view. Um, then, relating to the, the situation that we are facing now, and Martin also uh, raised this issue that, uh, um, and uh, we have been raising it, this, this issue in, uh, in the macroeconomic uh, dialogue at technical level uh, and also uh, in the tripartite social summit where we discussed uh, the economic situation and the cost of living crisis. Um, if the employment is going up but the hours worked is uh, not growing as fast and is kind of um, barely getting there uh, compared to the pre-COVID uh, um, time. Um, so something must be, off center in terms of uh, um, the quality of employment, because we know at the same time that uh, the wage growth has also been weak. It has been better this year, but even if you look at the, the kind of wage growth that has happened, it is still, the real wage growth is still negative. negative. Yeah, very negative. So, um, I, I, I have this, this deep seated feeling that, that, that looking at employment growth is not telling us the full story because I also know, because I work on social protection, I also know that poverty is growing. So I suppose that clearly the, the, this, this study, this research has its kind of boundaries and it has its frame, uh, but uh, someone, working with with different policy areas and also needing to to make sense how we can improve the social protection in the aging uh, societies how we can uh, fight poverty uh, in a incredibly high inflation and the energy costs um, how we can not just protect the numbers of people employed, but how we can protect uh, the purchasing power at the EU level, then I, I, I need a bit more. I need a bit um, extra information to, to have a, um, a clear picture. Um, I know that, that there are supply chain uh, bottlenecks. Um, and we haven't, I think, seen the full extent of these bottlenecks. Because during COVID, we had um, bottlenecks due to the lockdowns. Uh, and uh, the supply changes were interrupted. The goods weren't uh, sort of getting from one place to another at the beginning. Uh, production was also hit. Uh, we suddenly discovered that we, we have incredible desperate need for uh, microchips and they are all produced elsewhere in the world. And so we need to develop the production in Europe. So we have the CHIPS Act, um, which always made me smile. Okay, English is not my, my native language, but um, chips uh, in English are, <coughs> use a shorthand, chips are something that you eat, um, rather than put in all the electronic gadgets that we have around us in, in our lives. but. Um, so microchips, um, when now with the, with the war in Ukraine, um, I think we are seeing a different additional bottlenecks that are derived, derived from very different reasons. Um, so how is this going to play into and, and kind of 
One explanation when coming back to the sort of contra construction issue or, or the, the sort of negative impact on employment in the construction sector could be precisely that uh, despite the fact that there is incredible need for um, reconstruction uh, work, uh, the, the materials are not necessarily there. There are huge delays and, uh, and because of the price increases, uh, certain construction uh, projects are either delayed or or cancelled altogether so that that could feed into that's kind of how i try to explain it to myself but uh, um, again um, obviously people who who do all the calculations they know much uh, much better <clears throat> then another very important issue that that comes into it all is that if you want to um have um, the economy still growing, I think, especially looking at the, the unemployment figure and then the employment growth forecast figure, especially the optimistic one. Um, if unemployment is 6.5 and, and the employment growth in optimistic case can be up to 8%, where are these workers coming from? Um, And also, I think one of one of the, the issues that I have with data or the calculation of, of employ, employment is that if we take um, the widely used definition that somebody is considered to be employed if they work one hour a week, sorry, it's a joke. We can't possibly say that somebody is employed if, if he or she works only one hour a week. Um, so, as I said, for, for me, there are so many questions and, and uh, the kind of more I work on, on this dossier, the, the more questions I have. And the answer seems to be um, changing rapidly according to what is happening in the world, not necessarily inside the European Union, but, but in the world. So someone who, who wants to love facts and certainties, I had to keep all this up <laughs> because when dealing with uh, what I also learned uh, when, when dealing with macroeconomics, uh, um, the only things that are certain are what has happened already. You can measure and say that that's what the case. Everything what is to come, is not particularly certain. You talk to different uh, schools, you talk to different economists, and you get uh, uh, different answers, different forecasts, uh, growth uh, forecasts, uh, uh, predictions go up and down. Um, so again, thinking back to my the four years that the EDUC is going to face uh, from May Congress, what am I going to ask from the European Commission to do? What am I going to tell uh, in the discussions uh, uh, with our member organizations what they should be asking from their governments? What should happen? Which way we should be moving? What are the, the demands that we, we need to put forward? Um, one thing is clear, and uh, Joao, you, you mentioned um, the extraordinary instrument, the floor instrument during the COVID. What we are still demanding and will continue to demand is that uh, we. Uh, uh, we'll have a, should I call it short type instrument, or, or um, maybe it's better to call another support instrument that uh, helps uh, us all to deal with the cost of living crisis. Um, because it is necessary, and precisely because um, uh, 
economy in uh, uh, the 27 member states of the EU is so diverse. Um, and if we allow this diversity um, to grow rather than try to have a cohesion between the member states, the whole European economy and the market is going to suffer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lina, um, and all the discussions for the very insightful uh, comments. Um, at this point, I would like to open the floor to participants for any questions before um, giving the floor back to Robert, perhaps to address some of the um, uh, comments on uh, the study itself. Uh, maybe uh, yes, uh, I'm Farzan Shamsfah, researcher at the um, ZEP Center for European Policy Studies. Uh, my question is particularly on the projections of hours work. Uh, because the pattern we see the large drop in hours worked but the stable uh, employment rate i think it's mainly due to the extensive use of uh, short time working scam and i was wondering if this is uh, controlled and um, like in the model based uh, analysis that we've done otherwise uh, one would expect that the outcome would be different because what we see like the very slow adjustment of the uh the projections like uh, the past uh like uh, looks like a um, normal adjustment of a model to a shock. <laughs> so <laughs> that was my question. Thank you. Yes. Hi. Uh, Robin Gnanoel from the European University Institute. Uh, um, I have a question on the demogra demographical developments already kicking in. Uh, you're saying in certain sectors. I was wondering whether you already have a um, kind of breakdown across the sectors on where these are going to be more important than others and basically the extent to which but may, may also be related to uh, digitalization needs or not. I mean, typically there are two different types of demographics where you may have interesting intersections. So thanks. Um, Nicola Contouris from the ETUI. And I was uh, thinking about um, uh, the last open question that Mr. Nogueira Martins posed to us. Uh, uh, in terms of uh, the labor market and product market reforms of the last couple of decades. And it may well be that we have found an answer to the problem that we had, the problem of jobless growth. Uh, we may have reached a point where we have a job rich stagnation. Um, but I was wondering whether we shouldn't also explore the same type of correlation between these reforms and the problem that we're facing now, which is uh, 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 a wage slow growth, the potential for uh, dampen wage increases, even in periods of uh, uh, job growth and perhaps even economic growth in the future uh, with all the challenges that this brings. <clears throat> Daniel Kotzer, uh, ITUC. Uh, no, I, I, I have a couple of questions because I have the impression that the hours have been dislinking from the employment more and more, and the pandemic was a very clear event because you have teleworking, you have new forms, and hours have always been a very dodgy information, even in the best of the of the surveys. And now I think it's getting much more complex because of this combination of, of, of multiple things. So I, I'm not sure if uh, uh, you can link hours to wages and also uh, to employment. Perhaps it would be very interesting to have the same forecast for those that they work 30 or more hours, or let's call full-time workers, and see if, if you find a, a strong difference there. The other, the other issue, you know, uh, I, I wanted to see in the, in the paper, and I, I didn't find it, and I think that you should try to, to get it a little bit of consistency in the, in the information, as well as the numbers of employment and all these other data that the colleague was requesting. I, I went to do some quick numbers, and I used the, the uh, 
uh, employment to elasticity, uh, to growth elasticity in the EU during the, the period that you talked, that's more or less between 44 and 48. So it, it gets between the baseline and the and the optimistic uh, uh, the optimistic uh, uh, forecast that you made. But actually, I would like to see how much investment would be required to achieve taking into account. And, and there you perhaps working a bit more with the input output tables or or more a, a, a granular information on what may be the impact on consumption, on investment, to see how consistent is, uh, is macroeconomically the forecast that, that you are making. Because perhaps the forecast is okay, but when you see that you need to increase, I don't know, three points over the GDP investment, and you see that the, the process of buybacks and, and, and distribution of dividends that have been taking place during the last year in, in Europe, you say, oh, oh this in, in, uh, implies a question. I have the impression that big chunk of the recovery after the global financial crisis that you had here in Europe was with very low or constant investment, actually using spare capacity that came from, from before and a lot of uh, putting out and subcontracting outside the region. So this analysis of consistency of the of the forecasts are, uh, I think that could be complementary and very interesting to, to realize. Thank you. Uh, the lady, uh, yes, it was a little bit the same question that you Please present, present yourself. I think it's a good question. Would Please you Please present uh, yourself. Uh, my name is Tina Noiret. I am a teacher and a writer. Okay, so uh, my question was about the link between jobs and working powers, which is uh, irritated from Fordism. It's a Fordist way of looking into employment. Uh, as it was uh, told by uh, someone else, uh, he did work for which he wasn't paid. Um, regarding the Green Deal, uh, nearly all budget went to uh, renovating buildings. But surely that there are people who are working behind and who are not paid as a matter of fact. So, so the um, working hours maybe is a um, way of looking into employment irritated from the past and maybe um, even um, working more, it was said that maybe we don't need more jobs uh, by Mr. Martin Sandu. Um, maybe a mechanism to reward those who uh, work less would be uh, thought because um, Green Deal on the employment, it is also decreased the cost. So I don't know if it, it was clear, but it was a little bit the same question. Okay. Uh, Robert, I think okay. uh, a lot of questions <laughs> are for you. <laughs> well, thanks for all his comments and, and, and remarks to the to the study, uh, which, of course, given the, the the limitations of the budget, the model, etc., has its limitations itself. Of course, when, uh, I think also it, it's very good that the study like this raises questions rather than keeping bringing a lot of answers. And and you raised many questions now on GVCs on. On, on, on many aspects which are just outside the scope of, of this simple exercise, so to say. Um, it's very difficult, of course, to now focus on, on various things I, uh, for the, to select the, the, the specific topic. Let me start with my little secret. Um, I was writing my master thesis beginning in the 90s. At this time, the famous, a famous book has been by Jeremy, Jeremy Rifkin, on the end of work. Now, 30 years later, after a number of crises, after the digitalization, we're sitting here and talking about uh, we are overemployed, we have, we're at the capacity limits, etc. So it's, it, it, I fully agree on this on this sort of exercises. It's very difficult to to make all this this <laughs> to, to forecast the future. Of course, we and what we can do is, is of course we do it by, blessed by 
uh, whatever we can do in, in terms of, of number crunching. But of course, there are always this sort of qualitative issues, which might be again and also was mentioned by Martin, that we do not pick up strong structural shifts, which we haven't seen in the past. Yes, we can, we can of course, use some assumptions, but uh, depending on how this really will change the numbers, this is an issue. But for example, I wouldn't say that uh, changes would wrongly or such simulations would make a strong difference in the number of persons employed in manufacturing, uh, which might go up by one percentage point or go down by one percentage point, but it's not the big structural shift which, which we're facing. At least this it would, my, would be my, my judgment on that. Um, I, I also, before my, my main point, I come to, to this uh, on the impact on, on, on relative wages and, and real wages, et cetera, of course, at the time of the, when we were writing the study, it was beginning April, May, uh, when we started to do the calculations, there has been, at least amongst most of the big institutions, the consensus that inflation rates will go down again in autumn, which we'll probably not see. How these big inflation rates and economic development impact on real wages depends now very much, of course, on the wage negotiations, which kick in basically now and, and next year. Or so it is very difficult to forecast what these wage negotiations will begin. We, we know in Austria, we have now these wage negotiation rounds, you know, the, the trade unions and and, uh, and, uh, and, and businesses. And there's big uh, historical big differences in the starting points from 10 to 12% wage increases to uh, demanded by the union to 4% uh, offered by the, by the Chamber of Commerce. So, we have not never seen such a big spread of wage negotiations in the, at the beginning of the talks. And it very much depends, of course, on the outcome. So we have not looked at that in the study, but uh, of, of course, it's a very important point. But it's even harder to predict than this. this, this I think one of the common aspects which has been raised by many of you, and also a bit in the, in the audience, uh, is that, that we predict at least in the in this uh, the baseline and the optimistic scenario, employment grows by four, five, six percent. Uh, on the other hand, we face high, record high employment uh, rates or activity rates. Even so where does labor's workers come from? And this, I think that's the crucial point. And my my last bullet point in the slide was on the demographic aspect, which is exactly going in that direction. Um, we. And another study calculating also based on the added trends and productivity trends when labor supply in various countries will be less than the actual labor demand if these trends continue. And already at this time, with, well, this study was done five years ago or so, or before the, the corona. Um, already at this time, we found for some countries, particularly the Eastern European countries, that this peaking our uh, strong turning point should appear in between 2025 and 2020, 2030 already. Now, of course, then Corona came in, but uh, at least we, we saw that this turning point already should kick in uh, relatively early. And actually, I think we do already see this, as we said, in the construction sector, there's this labor shortages. Of course, there's this labor shortages in a sector which is not that well paid, which is hard work, which maybe the education systems in the countries don't really um, push people into that kind of hard work, manual work uh, sectors, plus migration flows are drying out because also Eastern European countries, which have been most of the migration flows for, to Western European countries, are drying out also in particular by demographic aspects. So I, I think we're already in that. And from Austria, I know this debate, well, I think 40, 50 percent of the teachers are in between 55 and 60. So there will be a big chunk of teachers leaving the labor market. We have the debate on healthcare system, which also lacks employment and so on and so forth. So, so I think we're already in the transition phase, uh, which is not in the data in the, in the study because we just project it. But we have not the feedback loops then. But of course, I think we hint this is the aspect in the way. And last point, unfortunately, Martin has to uh, had to leave. <laughs> he he argued basically whether do we want to have this strong employment growth or we are already at the high levels. Say, 
given that productivity growth rates are even more trendy, question, the question then ends up, do we want to have uh, macroeconomic growth or GDP growth at all? Because either we have strong, well, less GDP growth, um, then we have less employment growth if we're already at the capacity levels, or we have less, uh, well, more employment growth, but then we need more productivity growth to, to sustain the macroeconomic growth rate. So the question for me is a bit, do we want to have still macroeconomic growth rates, given the productivity trends? In the literature and exercises, we do not find strong impacts of digitalization on productivity, which is basically either non-robust or very small. Um, so we end up a bit on the question, do we need general growth rates? Given the strategy of cars to grow out of the debt crisis and so on and so forth, I think this is the, this is the valid question. And unfortunately, Martin is no longer here, but I think this in conjunction with productivity growth, employment growth, and, and macro growth is the thing we should focus on uh, and, and we will be. I'm not sure whether I should go over this detailed, detailed questions on the model and strategies just for, for your ones. Uh, this hours worked stuff. No, we used only the trend growth rate until 2019, uh, so that we have not this, this general shift over the crisis, which, which would be the difference. We take that into account in that sense, right? Mm -hmm. but, but we can discuss maybe later on this more, more detailed aspect. So I, unfortunately, I cannot go over this, but this is just my broad thoughts on, on how I see these big questions arising from very good discussion. Thank you very much. Uh, Joao Nogueira, would you like to? Uh, well, I was discussing, I don't have many uh, responses now. So me, but uh, if you, yes, if there, there was, there was indeed. Um, it was actually a, a good question. Have we shifted from a jobless growth to a job rich stagnation? Indeed, <laughs> it's a very good question. And we still need to understand better what is uh, behind that. Certainly, the evolution of wages, I'm not referring now in this year. But the evolution of real wages over the last decade is certainly behind that. And in that respect, it also connects us to other aspects, which are not only about total wages or average wages, but also on the dispersion of wages and issues about inequality. And when I'm talking now about inequality, I'm not talking about the bankers. I'm not talking about the tycoons. I'm not talking about the top 1%. I'm talking effectively about the distribution of wages in our societies that very often has uh, widened. And that's why it's so relevant to have action on minimum wages on which the have recently put uh, some proposals on the table. Uh, you know this certainly better than I do, and I will not elaborate uh, much more on uh, this for the time being. Two more details, but super telegraphically. Uh, uh, I think that when we discuss a uh, uh, number of jobs and uh, um, hours worked, I think we need to probably try to get better statistics than those that we currently have. The people that work short time do that in a voluntary manner, or is it in an involuntary manner? I think if without that information, we cannot really conclude what are the structural developments that happen take place in our, in, our, in our society. And finally, just because now when uh, 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 Robert uh, mentioned about productivity and about the digital transition, I remember that uh, famous sentence of Robert Solo, I believe probably in the beginning of the eighties, which was something like that, computers are everywhere except in the productivity statistics and probably I, I don't know when what is the date of that statement but probably 40 years after that we are still struggling with the same question you know would you like to make maybe just just to remind everybody that uh, when we're talking about productivity growth and wage growth then uh, for many many years now the wage growth has been lagging behind the productivity growth. That's, I think, another aspect, another element. And another aspect that I think is not, we don't know how much this is going to impact or what, whether it's going to have any impact at all, is that uh, with this incredible energy price increases, people who are very keen to telework are now actually returning to the offices. They are. So we we have so many unknowns. I think we can write this study sort of every every half a year or every quarter, and we get the different uh, outcomes. Okay. Um, 
Are there any other questions from the audience? Um, yeah, there is one. Um, what are your perceptions regarding flexible working arrangements are in this disruptive labor market? Do employees expect to have work from home legal rights soon? What is your intake on the rise of underemployment phenomenon, especially among young university graduates? Um, that's one question. And I have also one for... Um, um, you you mentioned, I mean, to, to, to add to what Nicola said, you mentioned the products and labor market reforms of the last decade and whether we can we reflect on whether we should credit and to what extent we should credit them for the surprisingly good uh, uh, outcomes we seem to see right now in terms of output and employment growth. Um, but then my, my question is, I have the impression that in the last decade, we saw different uh, labor market reforms in particular going in different directions. So uh, in the early years of uh, 2010s, we saw a lot of um, uh, deregulation, in, uh, especially in uh, member states that had to want to economic adjustment uh, program. And then there was 2015, Something seemed to started uh, uh, changing. Uh, I don't know whether it was uh, making virtue out of necessity with the pillar of social rights. Um, so some of them, uh, you know, whereas uh, in, in, for example, in before we would see that uh, labor market deregulation would be uh, the recipe, we saw that the, the, there were more calls for re-regulating the, the labor market so that, uh, you know, especially the differences between regular and more atypical contracts became, uh, uh, you know, uh, were reduced and not always at the expense of the, the regular ones. And as Nicola said, I mean, one, um, uh, there has been some insight that uh, real, uh, that wage stagnation, wage growth stagnation had to do some extent with um, uh, these labor market reforms that had been taking place even before the, the last decade uh, from the 90s. Uh, when you said you were um, uh, a student. And there is, I think, um, uh, there have even been studies, I mean, to come back to the issue of, uh, that Lena mentioned uh, on the disparity between productivity growth and, uh, or rather the decoupling between productivity growth and uh, uh, wage growth. There have been, uh, I can think of a study by the IMF, which attributed, I think it was a 15% of that disparity to the fact that um, uh, labor bargaining power declined over time as a result of labor market reforms undertaken for several decades. So what kind of these labor market reforms would you think that should be a, a matter of reflection on whether you know, we can uh, credit them with the surprisingly good results in terms of recovery that we see now? It was a genuine question. And therefore, the response to your question now is just, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But perhaps I should even be careful with the semantics. Some, I have used the expression structural reforms, and probably I should be wider and refer to structural transformations that have effectively taken place in our societies and in our economies, irrespective of changes in the regulatory context of the labor markets and the economies uh, more in general. In any case, I believe that the topic is sufficiently relevant and we do not know enough about that. And all the academic community, we certainly in the commission, you guys in the, in the trade unions and in the, in, the, in, in the member states, I think we should be well uh, uh, wise to reflect on, on that because I think these were my last words on when I read my initial intervention. I think we need to understand better the past to reflect about the, uh, the future. Any other questions, comments, remarks? Uh, yes, very briefly, please, because we have two minutes left. Uh, shall I give the floor first to Lady because you have already? Uh, yes, you present yourself. Uh, yes, so Helen Lamport here from uh, the UK Mission, working on labour and social policy. I just want to ask, like, in your opening comments about the report, you said that digitizing digitalization wasn't really like didn't think it was going to have a big effect so I was just wondering if you could say a bit more about like finding that will affect the like sorry did I speak really quickly <laughs> the, the digitalization has not that big impact on labor productivity growth or 
Yeah, I think you said like in your initial slides that you didn't think it was going to have a big impact. Yeah, well, well, this is just also based on the past experience and studies we have. So okay. well, we well, uh, using any indicator of digitalization, like the, the share of ICT technology in capital stocks, there's capital stock growth with of ICT, uh, some other indicators, when you regress on labor productivity, whatever period, country, sample, et cetera, we, you don't find very big, strong effects on labor productivity growth. As this famous <laughs> quote by, by Popsolo for right in the beginning 90s or 1987, I think it was the first yeah. time, was well, telling us. In the sense. It's a bit of a surprise. But nobody really can explain why we don't see that labor productivity impact. Fortunately, <laughs> so that for employment levels, it's okay because Elgo would see much less employment levels than these studies by, by Osborne and Frey already eight years ago, uh, basically predicting that labor employment will be declined by 50% or uh, jobs are at risk or so are just out. Out, out of out of magnitudes for what we see in the in the real data, as mentioned now on the panel also by Martin, to base very high employment rates, historically high employment rates in Europe generally, uh, and so if at all, say digitalization has, has contributed positively to overall growth and, and employment growth via via overall growth rates. In it's very difficult to explain why we see the computers everywhere and not in this productivity. Okay, and okay. on this note, uh, we'd like to thank everyone who joined us uh, today, uh, either in person, in here or uh, online, uh, for the very insightful uh, comments and feedback, uh, especially on the report. Um, and I would like to invite you to join us again uh, on the next uh, conference of the ETUI on the 8th of November at the Double Tree Hilton Hotel. Uh, the topic, Next Generation Youth in Action, its impact on social and labor policies. Thank you very much.